Hey class, for your next project, you're going to be designing using the element of value. Just show you this graphic again to remind you of the idea that we are dealing with elements and principles of art in this class. You've worked already with things like line, shape, and even to an extent texture, space. Well, we're going to do something with value. And you've been playing already with things like emphasis or focal points and balance and even transformation, which is kind of part of movement. Value is an interesting element. It has a lot of different implications for color as well. It's related to color because colors have value, but we're going to be working with achromatic scale and achromatic values, which basically mean black, white, gray, or you could kind of say maybe some other neutrals are fairly achromatic, but even beiges and browns have a little bit of color to them. So mostly when people say achromatic, they mean black and white, which includes all kinds of versions of gray. I show you this slide up here. This is kind of rough and it's scanning. Um, this is a better quality 10 step scale, but I do this because I want to show you that values are in relationship to other values. That's how we tell what is dark and light. This middle circle here is the same in every scale step. And it looks way white compared to black and quite dark compared to white. So the reason why that's important, because in your composition, you're going to need to think about the contrast of the values. But let's go over some different terminology here. When something, a subject matter, has value on it from a light source, like bright light shining on it, shading is what's on the form. So this is all shading through line work. We've done this a little bit already with our line assignment. And then whatever is cast by an object, it hits, and then it's cast on the opposite side is called shadow. You may know this termino terminology already, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. And lines and shapes create value and have value. It's pretty obvious, but a thicker and bolder and more darkly drawn line, depending on the different medium, like this is Cathay Colwitz charcoal self-portrait, um, has greater value, right? The thicker, bolder lines. And then um, thinner, lighter lines have less value. They're not as drawn as hard. This shows you a couple other types of terminologies. The highlight or reflected light is where your eye... The reflected light's the back part where the light bounces around the environment and kind of goes into the shade side a little bit. Well, the highlight is where the light strikes something and bounces back into your eye, so it looks almost white. Shadow, shade cut line. These are different terminologies, especially in drawing class we would use them. In the line one, I made you guys do all of your stuff through hatching and cross hatching, so you know already what that's about. It's this type of line work to create value. It also creates shape as well. So that's an interesting part of what we've already been using it for in other projects. This just shows another example of line weight as value. This is all done through printmaking work by Heinrich Clay. He's doing uh, intaglio etching on metal plates. So shapes also have value or tone is another word we could use. And we're gonna be using shapes of tones or values in this project. Value is how we get an illusion of real space in a lot of paintings. Um, these examples, I'm going to show you the color version and the value version, uh, achromatic value version, I should say. You can see what I'm talking about here to say colors have value, right? The reds are lighter, the pink, the white here. This is really dark brown, and in value, it's that almost that one right here, you can see. So... It's what gives us a feeling of illusion in painting and drawing. Um, it helps add, in addition to obviously correct proportions and accuracy, but it adds even more of an illusion. 
It also is a way to create the story of something. I use this idea to tell you that, to kind of point out something about two-dimensional design and maybe art in general. There's a way to think about um, iconography, iconology, in art history, which is a story or text behind the image. It's a way of interpreting it. Well, I think it's useful for values because it shows you the idea that depending on how your value shifts were in a piece of art, it would have like subtle shifts here, which are both basically black and white. This one I made black and white. This is Baroque art, or it's a deep shadow it's emerging from. Um, of course, the subject matter is very different, but nonetheless, even if the subject matters were the same, the story, in quotes, feeling of story, would be very different depending on how the values were used. Okay. We also talked about how value would be a way to create a focal point, and we talked about this piece already. I showed it to you in black and white, I mean color, not black and white, but I want to show you how dark irregular shape at the middle creates a focal point, right? This is Jeff Wall photograph, and you can see it here. So we've been using value in this way already too, so you can do it for creative reasons, like the story that you're trying to tell, focal points, so emphasis in a piece also for illusion of real space and then texture which we're going to be dealing with in our next project is reflected in value shifts this piece is interesting because it's made by finger paint finger painting and it's actually a fingerprint applied to over and over again to create this image which chuck close this is about his wife's grandmother so it has to do with identity it's conceptual idea of like the fingerprint being a one-of-a-kind original thing connected to him and his connection to this person, but also shows how texture built up can create imagery through the value, right? In this project, you're going to be using abstraction, which is, you know, kind of basically in a simplified way you were already doing by simplifying your object into basic shapes and transforming it through that simplification process well this just shows you abstraction is to all different levels from photorealistic that's obviously not abstraction down to really simple things it's on like a continuum you could have all different steps down to where this becomes even non-objective or um, pure abstraction in quotes some people call it pure where it's like barely even it's shapes of color or something like that that's not really very easily connected to the original maybe inspiration this is that continuum I'm talking about and this is a real piece by Theo van Doesburg I think it's interesting because he used a cow so I showed you the cows here just felt like having some kind of continuity on that he drew this study in 1916 okay and this is in the museum of modern art and he went through this process of simplification this is the final piece or the study for the final piece so it's this would be non-representational all of these have some level maybe of representation this is getting you know kind of non-representational pretty much but these are all these two especially are still representational this one's still naturalistic this is non-naturalistic so there's different terms we use but in the language of art but i just want you to know it's on a continuum you're going to be using hard edged abstraction for this if you're going to um, do abstraction and you're going to do abstraction because it's going to be simplified okay because of the way the project works you're going to have to simplify it but it, it's up to you as to how far you abstract it. You don't have to do non-representational abstraction. But the project does need to be hard-edged. These are examples of them. Um, because, and some of them aren't perfectly hard-edged, but I wanna, I'll want i make it clearer too as we go along why it's hard-edged is because you're gonna be using a set number of values, five of them, 
in your project. So I don't want you to have too many values because it gets hard to unify and um, control the story that you're creating, right? So we could call this arrangement of the amount of variation in light and dark a value pattern. It's independent of color because color has a value, but it's connected to color, I should say. Um, they have an interesting relationship, basically, is what you should say, was what I should say. This is an example by George Brock. Pretty hard-edged. He's done quite a bit of blending, but he's still deconstructing an object. This is Ferdinand Leger, more hard-edged. You can see how he's using blocks of color, but this is a black and white version over there. This one's fully hard-edged piece. I think you may have drawn this already, or you're going to be drawing it as one of your drawings. You can see how everything has a clean, tight edge to it. Metzinger, pretty hard-edged. This is the original painting. He has some blending in here, but he's abstracting using cubism where the shift a viewpoint is happening and he's getting like multiple viewpoints all in a single piece which is what a lot of cubism is about originally so these are different types of ways people abstract in art history but you don't have to do this these are just examples this one's fully pretty much hard edged except for that but you can see basically when I'm saying hard edge I mean shapes of value and there's all different ways you could do abstraction. This is an interesting piece by Picasso called Guernica in response to um, Civil War. Pretty haunting quality to it. And interesting use of black and white to create a lot of drama. This piece by him is much different in its subject matter. But also, if you notice the whole thing has a darker, darker keyed colors, it's on the darker side of the value scale overall with a couple exceptions and that gives it a much different feeling to the piece it has like a somber tone to it this is really a, a lot of drama and in a certain way there's greater spectrum of values all the way to white whites and then dark darks and then some middle grays so that creates a different type of story so you're going to want to think about how you use your values this is a brand I recommend, Liquid Text. Their basic um, line is like a student grade. It's decently good. You're going to be using acrylic paint for this. Titanium White and Mars Black are two great ones to use. There's different names of different paints. You don't want to get one that says like Payne's Gray. That's not a black. Um, there's Ivory Black as well. That would be fine. Um, there's different names for whites, but it has to be black and white. You can pick what brushes you get, but I, if you don't have any brushes, I recommend starting with a round brush, which are these ones. And size 6 or 8 are good sizes to start with because they come to a point still. If you have other types of brushes, you can get them and use them if you want to. Brushes are named after the type of um, shape. This is like a fan. This is a filbert. This is a flat. Um, these are liner brushes. So it's up to you. These are shading brushes. They're called shaders, I believe. If you're in the store buying a brush, you'll notice the number is on the handle. Every company has slight variations in their numbers. So like if a 10 for... These are Robert uh, Simons brushes, or simply Simons. Um, they have a little variation. It doesn't say the exact size, like as in inches, but number 8. But they're generally, you know, in between, kind of similar. It's best to maybe stick with one brand if you want to get an exact variation of sizes or just kind of know the general size because an 8 with one company might be more like a 6 with another, but generally pretty similar. So you're going to want to get like an 8 or 6 um, and a round. It gets still a point to it, but... You want to, when you go in and buy them, make sure that you don't have a bunch of little, um, like, stray hairs coming off of them. Let me see if I can draw it. Sometimes when you buy a brush, it'll have little bits coming off like that, where it kind of got 
ruined in transit, you want to try to keep them as clean and straight as possible. And when you first get your brush, you're going to want to clean it out with water before you use it in a little, tiny, tiniest little bit of, um, you can use a tiniest bit of soap, but you want to be really careful with that. It's better to have brush soap. Um, you can use natural brushes if you want, but I don't get the hog hair bristle ones. Um, you want it, it's best for the quality and money to get synthetic that are recommended for acrylic or watercolor. Because if you get those ones that are like natural hair that are really rough, it's hard to do paint, uh, fine paint lines with them. When you get into natural hair bristle brushes, um, they get really expensive to get ones that are smooth. So that's what I recommend for these supplies. Just want to remind you fully of what achromatic means. So we can see in relationship between photography and the values, you can get a wide range of values in paint. And obviously photography, black and white photography has a really wide range as well. But you could create this whole image if you wanted to mixing paint. And you can kind of begin to identify where values are used. So this value pattern in this picture could be replicated in paint and you would get a composition. So that's what we're talking about with achromatic value and value pattern. I'm just going to pull up the assignment sheet for a second and just work at it with you. So you're going to be exploring composition. It has to be composed well. It's design class and value with acrylic paint. You're going to create an original hard edge design with five values black and white acrylic paint. These are the brushes I was talking about. I recommend working on Bristol or watercolor paper because painting on thin paper will make it difficult for it to um, stay to stay flat. It'll start to buckle on you. Also, uh, you can tape it down. It's very good to tape it down. You'll see that in the demo video. I'll tape it down. It helps it not get all over the place. And then you can have option of using three small containers because you're only using five values. You're going to want to mix more paint. So that's up to you. I do also give you the option to use scissors and glue to um, collage this whole thing by making big swatches of the black, white, and three grays and actually make it like a collage. But I recommend painting it. And then you can use other brush sizes if you like them, if you have them. The assignment is to first make a 10 step value scale using black and white acrylic paint. One step should be pure black and one pure white, not the white of the paper. Okay, I suggest that you paint more swatches and then cut them and put them in arrange and then glue them down because it can be hard, quite hard to actually just make a square, make a square and paint them perfectly. You can cut them out. Then you're going to take three gray values, one in the middle between black and white, middle, so you have black, white, and you get to pick for your composition three in here, maybe like this one, this one, and one of these. I'm not letting you use infinite number of values because I want you to really focus on value and have to think about it, and if you had a wide infinite range, it's too hard to become intentional about it. So you remix them, that's why you might want to have those little containers. And then you're going to use your use those to decide which values you're going to use for your design. And you're going to paint and create the whole thing with the five values. This is really important. When you mix the three values, mix enough because it's very hard to match the paint after you start. You don't want to have to be trying to match and repainting a bunch of stuff. Okay. You create a design using shapes. So you're going to really want to work in shapes. That's why the last project had you simplifying things. A lot of it was shapes to help you figure this type of stuff out. Each shape has to be only one value. This means you won't be blending them together, hard edged. And as I say, you have the option to paint out large swatches and then create your own collage with hand tinted paper. Your composition needs to have a focal point or movement using your techniques from your last project. Think about balance, contrast, repetition to make it interesting, and all the things you've been learning already. Okay, It's building on previous ideas and skills you've been developing. 
So that first thing in the project is to become really intentional with how you mix your paint. You gotta spend some time on this. I'm gonna just write this down real quick because it's easy to think, oh, I can do this really quick. This will take a while. It's cheesy to do that, but this is going to take a while. You can't just do this overnight. Well, you could st stay up late and do it overnight, but I mean, you can't just do it in a couple minutes. To do this properly is going to take some decent time, and you're going to learn a lot from it. To mix this middle gray, you're not just going to go, okay, equal number of, equal amount of black, equal amount of white, and I'll get this middle gray. The black pigment's a lot stronger than the white pigment, so you're going to have to figure that out and play with it and kind of fine-tune and work and figure out how your pigments work. That's the point of this. So you're going to replicate this one, equally spaced tones. See how there's a natural jump between them, and it's about the same amount of jump each time? Well, that's what I mean by equally spaced tones. Black, white, 1 in 10. And then you're going to want to start your composition. How do you start a composition? You may want to work with some photographs that you're interested in or an object that has an interesting shape. That'll be in that's a way to do it like Dozberg did with a cow. Um, working larger is easier to fill in the shapes with the paint. I don't give you a size rec uh, requirement, but I promise you if you try to work on like 8 by 10 scale, you're going to be frustrated. You want to work larger. It's going to help you a lot. You need to draw out various compositions and pick one. Don't wing it. I make you guys do in-progress posts, but this is important not to just quickly go, oh yeah, whatever. Work through the ideas of eye movement, you know, all the things we've been talking about. I'll give you those examples. You need to focus on the shapes, not blending them together. This means hard-edged. You're going to have to design using shapes. So what have you learned already that's important? Focal points. Make a dynamic composition. You're going to want to think about what is your story that you're communicating and what should be the center of the story, the most important point of it, and capture that using focal points like we talked about with texture, isolation, difference, all the different ways. This is crystallographic, so you're not going to be doing that. But you could use isolation, you could use placement, you know, you could use diagonals in a vertical environment. You remember that stuff, so you want to maybe review that. you got to remember how your eye moves. We talked about how this piece has good continuation. The line of continuity run, running through this whole thing, it means that your eye stays in the composition longer. This kind of throws it off a little bit right here. It means people are going are gonna to spend some time on it. If you have a good design, who wants to make something, spend a lot of time working on it, and then have it so that no one wants to look at it? Or they look at it really quick and something and it drives their eye out and they're like, okay, see you later, I don't care about looking at this anymore. There's a reason why in design you might want to drive someone's eye out of a piece for a conceptual reason, but overall, generally speaking, we want to learn how to control eye movement and have people pay attention to our work, right? So this is part of what we're learning. And you want it to think about balance. You could do symmetrical, it's more static, or if we can find some dynamic, asymmetrical, informal balance, it's up to you. But don't forget about that part of what you've been learning. Okay, and then you learned quite a bit about simplification in the forms into interesting shapes. This is by Picasso. Um, he's getting way too simple here. Obviously, this is not an example of your project. You have to be purely shape. You're not doing line work. Okay. Some student examples. You'll see in the examples I give some commentary about um, what's working and not working on them. It's not a value judgment of them, but just for you to learn. 
from the work um, and that's part of critique, right? We've talked about this already in our class. It's not a statement about the person's work, worth as a human, but the work, just learning from it. This is a good piece. Um, interesting background. The main thing that breaks the rules is she used Sharpie and line work. Okay, not shapes. But overall, interesting. Also, this part of Mickey Mouse's clothes bleeds basically into the white. There's no difference. It needs to be a contrast somehow. So, not probably the right choice of value for that shape. This is a really interesting piece. It's like um, a deer fading into the background, kind of like camouflage and a deer all at the same time. It looks really interesting. Main thing for this is craftsmanship. Some of the um, parts here have a little white showing, so that and a little bit fuzzy edges. But overall, looking really nice and interesting dynamic movement, diagonal, and it keeps our eye interested in it. This one's just using the um, silhouette of someone's face and repeating it and then playing with the interaction of the shapes. Kind of um, static in a way, but not uninteresting. So that's a cool idea to start with. This one's nice, but it's an interesting gestalt, which is the overall shape, but it doesn't really think about eye movement and it doesn't feel like a total composition. It just feels like something floating on the page. They also use line work around it. I like this one, it's good. Using too much line work again, and this is craftsmanship issue right up here. So you gotta, you gotta pay attention to your craftsmanship. I've talked about ragged edges already a couple times, and this type of stuff where it's not finished, doesn't feel complete. That's craftsmanship. Takes away from it. This is very nice and clean, but it's lacking visual interest, so the craftsmanship's really high. But the composition's honestly a bit on the boring side, right? It's, it's interesting, but it could use more variations of shapes, probably. Mostly all triangles. You know, there's something going on with it, but maybe a little bit more consideration of eye movement and um, repetition of different shapes to create some um, visual interest. This is nice, but they did a lot of blending in various sections. And still got... people get really locked into their idea more than remembering the assignment, the idea of the assignment. And so they end up blending and doing line work because that's what their idea requires. But you need to change your idea to fit the assignment. Don't get, don't get uh, distracted by this cool idea you have. Have a cool idea, but change it to fit the assignment. This one was based on a photograph of a cat. Uh, would have been better for them to put these on a different page. It's got clean edges that help it, but it's a bit too simplistic for the amount of time you have to work on these things. I don't want to see something... And if it's going to be this simple, it needed to be dead perfect, and it's got fuzzy edges, weird shapes, kind of wonkiness to it. So you really don't need to be thinking, oh, I'll make it simple and just do it really quick. you got to have a good, good design worked through. This one's got a really strong focal point, a good use of white in between the scale shapes and things. Um, they may have left a little bit too much white paper around it. They could have maybe cropped it a little bit better. To just, they could have cut it afterwards, honestly, but we'll see. What could they have done? You know, they could have moved it and had a little bit tighter, might have made it more interesting, or moved this up even a little bit, um, and had that not so much white paper up here and this one so close to the edge. So think about the edge of your page, is what I'm trying to say with that. But clean edges, lack of blending, use of white make this successful and it's pretty interesting like this is breaking out into the space got a strong kind of um, balance but difference um, so interesting piece this one has a lot of visual interest but it would have been benefited a lot from cleaner edges higher degree of craftsmanship but it's interesting this one draws our eye out in a couple places like right here and that's a bummer. They needed something a little darker to pull our eye back in if they're going to drag it out, but still successful. And this one's nice, but 
It's a little too simple, and they blended a bunch in the main part of it. And then the rest of it is really simple, so it needed to be really crisp, tight edges in these spots. Um, I should have probably had something beyond this over here, secondary focal point or element, to make it fully successful. So that's using the element of value to design. And if you have questions, I really want to make sure you ask them. And you really need to start out strongly by just spending the time and mixing the steps of the paint. Um, whilst also, if you get bored with that, set it aside and work through some of your ideas and your compositional ideas. But you got to do this before you paint it, otherwise, um, you're going to end up not really understanding the pigments. And it's kind of a little tedious, but it's every design class ever makes you do this. Um, when I took design, they even were more intense and made us mix every color we had together to create a whole spectrum of that color paint. So I'm letting you off. Not easy, but a little bit right now. Next project we'll be doing color, so there'll be more to go with this, but you can do it. I believe in you. It takes some time, but you're really going to have to work it through. And when you do it, if you do it in swatches on paper, thicker paper, you can cut them out and make them an even exact size and then rearrange them instead of just painting it on one size of paper. I'm going to do a demonstration of different ways you can do it, but you want to make sure you don't do tiny little spots when you do it. Okay, so go ahead and make sure you get your supplies and start working on this step and the composition and keep on keeping on. All right, guys, you're doing great. So if you have questions, I have lots of ways you can contact me. You can um, schedule an appointment. I have my regular office hours. I can be contacted through Canvas inbox, email, pronto. I prefer anything through Canvas because then it's cleaner and easier to not lose emails. But I want you guys to you know reach out if you need help. So take care out there, and I'll be speaking to you really soon.